As the basis for our meditation, this first Vesper service of the new year, I thought I might share with you some thoughts on New Year's resolutions. Now, I don't know how many of you have already made New Year's resolutions. I trust that in one way or another, we all have. And I just want to share some with you that some of you at least will want to take one or more. I'm going to give you seven, but you can have more, or you can select from these one or two that especially appeal to you. They're not intended to take in the whole field. They're just some that have appealed to me yesterday and today as I have been thinking over the beginning of the year. The first one is in 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter and the 15th verse. Here is a resolution that Paul made, or at least a purpose that he expressed. And I was thinking of it yesterday morning as we opened the new year, and we were singing, Jesus, keep me near the cross. And I was noting the words of that beautiful prayer song, and Paul's expression came to my mind, and I made up my mind that this year I was going to notice the words that I sang more than before. Do you ever find your mind wandering while a hymn is being sung? Well, I do. I have many things to think of. I suppose you do. And I find that sometimes the most beautiful message can be expressed in song or the most beautiful prayer expressed. And my lips can be repeating the words, and I suppose there's some track in my mind that's running on like a tape recorder or a phonograph, but the upper part of my mind is not really getting it all. And I've made up my mind this year to uh, focus my attention more on the words I sing. Paul says here, I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. We have some beautiful words in our hymn book, and I'm determined this year to get more out of them than ever before. Would any of you like to do that? Just try it and see what a blessing it gives. The second one that I've already been getting a blessing out of is this. To cherish every desire of the soul after God. The reference is Ministry of Healing 503. Many have a twilight perception of Christ's excellence. Their hearts thrill with joy. They long for a fuller, deeper sense of the Savior's love. Let these cherish every desire of the soul after God. The Holy Spirit works with those who will be worked, molds those who will be molded, fashions those who will be fashioned. Do you see? From time to time we feel the movings of the Spirit. A desire wells up in our hearts to be more like Jesus, to do this or that good thing, to say this or that word, to pray or to study the word, or just some tender thought of Jesus. My resolution is to cherish every one of those. You know what it is to cherish something, don't you? To notice it and give it special attention. If you cherish somebody, you love them, and you give them some attention. Now the thought is to cherish every desire of the soul after God. Every time a desire toward God comes into your heart, just notice it. And thank God for it, and express it in some way to God. Cultivate every desire of the soul after God. I believe, friends, that as we do that, we're going to find that they're growing just like a well-cultivated garden. What do you say? All right. 
the third is to cherish a spirit of praise and thanksgiving. Why, do you know, friends, when I came to the close of the day yesterday and I started to think about all the things there had, that had happened just that one day, New Year's Day, to thank the Lord for, I declare, it was just a whole flock, a whole flock of things. And do you know what I believe? The more we notice what God does, and the more we talk about it, the more there is to notice and to talk about it. I know there are difficulties and trials, and I know that the people around us make mistakes. We do ourselves. And if we choose to collect those failures, the way some people collect stamps or butterflies, I declare, friends, we can really have a big collection. You never run out. The faults and failings of others, the difficulties and trials of the way, the things that people do to us that they shouldn't and the things they ought to do and forget to do or don't do, we could really have a great deal to talk about. But my resolution is to cultivate this spirit of praise and thanksgiving to talk of the things that glorify my master. Ministry of Healing 253 has something wonderful on this. Oh, see if you don't thrill with it. If we would give more expression to our faith, rejoice more in the blessings that we know we have, the great mercy and love of God, we should have more faith and greater joy. No tongue can express no finite mind can conceive the blessing that results from appreciating the goodness and love of God. Just appreciating the goodness and love of God, it says it gives us blessings greater than anybody can express. Now watch. Then let us educate our hearts and lips to speak the praise of God for his matchless love. You know, friends, there's some people, whenever I meet them, they've got something to be thankful for and happy about. It'd be too bad to be a person that, that whenever people meet me, I'd hate to be a person that whenever people meet me, they think, well, I wonder what he's going to complain about today. I wonder what it is that is bothering him today. I wonder what he's got to talk about unhappy. I don't want to be that way. Do you? Oh, I want to praise my heavenly master. And so I'm intending to do just what this says. And I'm already getting joy out of it. Let us educate our hearts and lips to speak the praise of God for his matchless love. Well, the next thing that I have decided, friends, and I really mean this with all my heart this year, and that is to read more of the inspired writings to read more of the inspired writings, to spend more time with the precious things that are revealed from heaven in the Bible and in the spirit of prophecy. You remember how Jeremiah expressed his appreciation of the word of God and what it meant to him in Jeremiah 15, 16. And I know a little bit of how Jeremiah felt because the more I feed on the word of God, the more joy it brings me. Jeremiah 15, 16. I hear the leaves of your Bible rustling. That's good. When we found this text, perhaps you'd like to read it with me because it expresses a secret of happiness that we all want to be well acquainted. All together... Thy words were found, and I did eat them, and thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart. 
For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. And so, in entering in to this experience, I propose to actually spend more time with the Bible and the spirit of prophecy this year than I did last year. Would any of you like to join in that? Well, thank the Lord, friends. There's a feast of good things, and they're new every day. I've just been enjoying that first volume, first book of selected messages. I knew it was good when I first looked in, looked in it. But my, as I begin to feed on it, it is simply marvelous, just wonderful. And I want to get a great many precious meals out of that pantry this year. Now, as I thought about it, to be realistic in our resolutions, the only way we can spend more time in one direction is to spend less time in some other direction. I think sometimes we forget that in our resolutions, New Year and otherwise. We decide we'll spend more time with this and more time with this and more time with this and more time with this without figuring where it's coming from. It's like a man with a limited income. Some of you have limited income, so you know what I mean. It's like a man with a limited income deciding that he's going to buy more of this and more of this and more of this, but not figuring out what he's going to buy less of. To be practical and realistic, whenever we decide to spend more time in one direction, we need to deliberately plan to spend less time in some other direction. Is that good management? And so, in deciding to spend more time with the inspired sources, I have deliberately decided to spend less time this coming year with the uninspired material. That means books, even good books, that are written by uninspired men, and magazines, and newspapers, and anything else that's uninspired. Now, you notice I didn't say I had decided that I'd never look at any of those things this year. Uh, that would be... Uh, rather impractical and uh, there are things that God gives us in current events in fulfilling prophecy there are things that God gives us from various sources in scientific lines and so I don't intend at all dear friends to adopt an extreme position of going on a diet of nothing but the Bible and the spirit of prophecy that would be extreme but I think most of us, and I'm one of them, can move a great deal farther in that direction without getting extreme. I think if we got clear to that point, it would be extreme. But I propose deliberately to spend less time with the uninspired material and more with the inspired. And one verse that has encouraged me in this direction is another one from Jeremiah. Jeremiah 23 28. I like the way it's put here. Last part. What is the chaff to the wheat, saith the Lord? And the wheat he's talking about is the word of God, as the line above says. He that hath my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat, saith the Lord? Man's books with worthless chaff are stored. God's book doth golden grain afford. Then leave the chaff and spend your pains in gathering up the golden grains. That's what I want to do this year, my dear. Now I have another resolution, and one that I trust a number of you here tonight will join me in. The text that encourages me in it is Acts 2.46. It's simply this, to relax and be happy and enjoy every meal I eat. Would any of you like to get in on that resolution? Well, I notice some of you look happy at that thought. 
And I believe God wants us to do that, friends. To do that, we'll need to banish care and worry and responsibility and concern and plans and arguments and committee work at the table. We may be busy, but we're not so busy as some of these presidents and prime ministers that have to hold cabinet meetings and other things while they eat. Praise the Lord. When we sit down at the table, barring always some emergencies and exceptions, but uh, it's our privilege to relax and lay aside care. We're told to. And enjoy our food. God made it that way. What? satisfaction would God get out of making all the delicious flavors and odors and wonderful colors and other appeals that lie in food, I say, what satisfaction would he get from all that unless his children enjoyed those things? What do you say? Let's make God happy by being happy when we eat. Now, the text says, this is the early church when they'd received the Spirit, And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, the margin says at home, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. Why, sure, friends, the people were impressed with that group that were so happy. They were happy every day. They were enjoying their food. And the people that looked on, they said, this is really a happy group. What had happened? They'd received the Spirit of God. You know this matter of thorough mastication. That isn't just simply a ritual, neither is it a gymnastic exercise to increase the circulation of the blood up here in the facial muscle, muscles. No. The great primary purpose of thorough mastication, friends, is that we may get more enjoyment out of our food. That's the truth. That's why the Lord put the taste buds and the olfactory nerve up there where we could get the benefit of those wonderful flavors, delicious odors. But much much of that is lost by rapid eating, and the sense of pleasure of it is lost if our minds are on many wearisome and worrisome thoughts. So, let's follow the example of the early church. What do you say? Let's break bread at home with gladness and singleness of heart. They weren't trying to carry a great many things in their minds while they were eating. They they were enjoying the things that God had given, and they weren't worried and diverted by a mass of things. Well, now I have one more, friends. And I don't know, some ways I think perhaps this is the most important of all and the sweetest of all and the most precious of all. And that is to enter into a still closer fellowship with my Lord, guarding jealously the time to be alone with him. Alone with God. Alone with God. Sitting at the feet of Jesus. Oh, what words I hear him say. Happy place. So near. So precious. May it find me there each day. I need the blessing of worship with others. I need the experiences that come in praying together here at the family altar. But all my soul needs to be all alone with God. Does yours? Oh, yes. Nothing can take the place of that. I find here in Ministry of Healing, page 58, very clearly and beautifully expressed all who are under the training of God, need the quiet hour for communion with their own hearts, with nature, and with God. We all need it. And what God has done for my soul in days that are past along this line encourages me to believe that if I press in more, I'll get more. It's there for me, and I propose to get it. 
I think one of our greatest dangers is the danger of substituting human fellowship for divine fellowship. Human words for divine words. Human counsel for heavenly counsel. Human conversation for communion alone with God. Great danger of it. And I want to tell you, friends, even if we could have Moses on one hand, one side, and Elijah on the other talking with us, it wouldn't take the place of being alone with God. And there's nobody on this campus that's anywhere near where Moses and Elijah were. And I submit to you that no matter what blessings we get, being around the table together, being at worship together, or working together, in the field, or in the shop, in the treatment room, or wherever, or just sitting and visit. All those have their place. But ah, if any one or all of them together crowd out the time alone with Jesus, dear ones, we're missing something. Listen, Desire of Ages 69. Do you know the great reason why Jesus didn't go to the schools of his time, even though they were, were religious schools? In fact, they were the descendants of the schools of the prophets. The schools that Jesus didn't go to were the schools that had been started by Samuel and resurrected by Elijah and Elisha. Those very schools had come to the point where Jesus didn't dare go to them. You know why? I read it here in Desire of Ages 69. Absorbed in the round of external. The students found no quiet hours to spend with God. Now they studied the Bible. The children in those schools knew by heart the first five books of the Bible, the time they were 12 years old. They really studied it all right. But absorbed in the round of external. The students found no quiet hours to spend with God. They did not hear his voice speaking to the heart. In their search after knowledge, they turned away from the source of wisdom. More than once, when I've been faced with some decision that I knew no human being could give me the answer to, I've had to get away all by myself and with God and pray the thing through. We don't have some great crisis of that kind every day, friends. But every day we are facing decisions which will either prepare us for those great crises or leave us unprepared. And no day are we safe without prayer. Jesus would appreciate it if we would come to him every day instead of when we're just in some great trouble and facing some tremendous decision. He would appreciate it if we would visit with him, shall I say, just because we love him. We're not to make of religion a fire escape. Prayer is not to be a spare tire. Prayer, as we have read, is the breath of the soul. And so, this New Year's season, I do thank God that he's leading my heart to be impressed anew with the great privileges and opportunities in being alone with him. Alone with him. Not to withdraw from the needs and problems of humanity and live a hermit's life. Oh no, friends, there's nothing attractive about that to me. There wouldn't be to God. 
No sooner had Jesus been blessed on the mountain that he came right down to the problems in the valley. You remember that. He took the disciples with him right into one of the greatest problems of their ministry. The purpose of being alone with God is that we may gather the blessings which we can impart to others. Oh, let us not go with empty baskets. When the multitude are seated on the, that grassy field, and Jesus has blessed the bread. Let us be sure that we have that consecrated, blessed bread in our baskets before we hurry to the waiting fifties or hundreds. What do you say, folks? Shall we not? Alone with God. Alone with God. Well, those are the things that my heart is impressed with this New Year's season. Perhaps you would like to express your heart's decision as you face the new year. It may be some other thought that is in your heart tonight that you'd like to express. If each one will speak very briefly, many can take part. And then I have some beautiful pictures to show you as we close. Who would like to speak now? To the glory of God. We want to spend just a few moments in reviewing the closing scene of the life of Jesus. And remember, we are told that we are to do this eating of the bread and drinking of the wine in remembrance of Him. We'll begin with that first day of the last week of our Lord's life before the crucifixion. You remember that the, the, the disciples were full of joyful enthusiasm as the Savior, seated upon the coast, rode into Jerusalem, receiving the glad praises of the multitude who expected him to be crowned king. Jesus was the only one in that great group that knew where he was going. He knew. And while he accepted their praises in fulfillment of prophecy, it was always clear in his mind that that was but the prelude to the great sacrifice. You remember that as he came into the city, the Pharisees asked him to rebuke the disciples and the multitude that were praising him. But he said if these should hold their peace, the very stones would cry out, prophecy must be fulfilled. We see him the next day in the temple, presenting his closing messages of warning. We see the priests <coughs> resisting the teaching of one who spake as never man spake. And while the common people heard him gladly, Christ recognized that only a few would fully receive all that he had to impart. And so in sorrow he had to turn away from a nation which rejected him. We see him alone on all of it as he climbs those steps back toward Bethany, looking out with love and sorrow over that city that he loved so much. Thursday evening we see him in the upper room with his disciples, giving this wonderful example of loving service and humility. Following this, he gave them the bread and the wine, that represented his broken body and still blood. And then out in the shadows of Gethsemane, he wrestled in prayer for those, those long hours till midnight, when the mob, led by Judas, 
arrested him. The disciples fled, and Jesus was led away to the palace of the high priest where he was arraigned before earthly tribunal, <coughs> charged with blasphemy and sedition. Perhaps the hardest blow that came to the heart of Christ that night was the denial of Peter. Standing there by the fire in the courtyard, Peter hoped to escape notice. But you remember that someone who had seen him in the garden recognized him as a follower of Christ, asked him if he wasn't, but he denied. Finally, another accused him and denied, and then with cursing and swearing, he made the third denial. Then Jesus turned and looked upon Peter. That look of love and pity and forgiveness broke Peter's heart. Wesley sings, Jesus, let thy pitying eye call thy go wandering sheep. False to thee like Peter, I would fain like Peter would. <coughs> After the priests and the Sanhedrin had passed judgment upon Jesus, he was hurried away by the mob to Pilate, the Roman governor, who awakened at an early hour, determined to make short work of this trial. But as he gazed upon Jesus, he became perplexed, for he saw there one who bore not the slightest indication of anything criminal, but rather on his countenance were the marks of divine love. And Pilate, the more he talked with Jesus, the more he desired to get rid of the whole problem. He sent him to Herod, you remember. But Herod, after he had tried to get Jesus to work a miracle and couldn't, Herod, Although he was hardened in sin, he dared not pass judgment upon Jesus and send him back to Pilate. By this time, Pilate was so anxious to get rid of the whole problem that he suggested they scourge Jesus. So he was turned over to the soldiers and the heavy lashes were laid upon him. The Bible says he was wounded for our transgression and bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. He was whipped for us. And then the soldiers took him into the guard room, and they mocked him and sought to humiliate him in every rude and insulting way, clothing him with a scarlet robe, making a crown of thorns to put upon him, and in mockery hailing him as king of the Jews, spitting in his face, hitting him with a reed. This was just after he had been tortured with the scourge. Oh, what a loving Savior, and through it all, dear friends, we're told that he bore himself with divine love, sympathy without the least word of ill temper or ill will toward any of those folks. Brought back into the presence of Pilate, he was presented to the multitude. They were given their choice between him and Barabbas, led by the priests. The multitude chose Barabbas that thief and murderer, and called for the crucifixion of Jesus. About this time, a messenger pressed through the crowd and delivered a note to Pilate, which was Pilate's wife. And he opened it and read it, his face turned pale. 
The message said, had nothing to do with that just man, for I have suffered many things in a dream because of him. We're told that it was the Holy Spirit that ministered to Pilate's wife on that occasion and gave her this dream in which she saw Jesus, his loving ministry, saw his crucifixion, saw his resurrection, saw him coming in glory. He warned Pilate not to touch him. But as Pilate lingered, you know what I mean? What an indecision was here. The more he lingered, the more he parleyed, the more he was led, step by step, to the final act. We're told that indecision soon becomes decision in the wrong direction. God help us, friends, to have character. What do you think? <laughs> and here we see him in the final decision, calling for a servant with a basin of water. He washes his hands before the multitude. What for? He says, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. And like wild beasts, they bellow forth their frenzy cry, His blood be on us and our children. But while the blood of Jesus was on that nation, Pilate did not by his washing escape the responsibility not all the waters in all the rivers of the world could wash away that stain, my friend. Then Jesus was led out to be crucified. He fainted beneath the heavy cross, you remember. And finally they had to find one, there, Simon, Cyrene. And arriving at Calvary, about nine o'clock in the morning, Jesus was stretched upon the wooden bars and nailed to the tree. No imprecation came from his lips. It was a prayer for his murderers. What was it? Let's say it together. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Many was hung up between the heavens and the earth. Die. Three hours in the burning sun. Here we see John with Mary, the mother of Jesus, at the cross as the Savior commits her to the care of his closest disciple. Jesus, keep me near the cross. There a precious fountain, free to all a healing stream, flows from Calvary's mountain. As midday drew near, the sun was blotted out by a great darkness that came over all the land. And for three hours, Jesus hung in the darkness at three o'clock in the afternoon. During those terrible hours, Jesus was shut in. Away from the gaze of the multitude, but locked in combat with angry demons. He trod the winepress alone. He was bearing our sins, the wrath of God against transgression. He was wrestling with the temptations of Satan that if he became the propitiation for a lost race, that he himself would be lost and never live again. And from that darkness he cried finally, O oh God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He felt forsaken. There was no light from heaven. But our friend, when Jesus saw that you and I would be lost unless he took the plunge, he was determined that even though it meant that he would never live again, he was determined to go through. And in full submission to his father, he gave his life a sacrifice. If it meant forever, he was willing. 
that you and I might be redeemed. And somehow, dear ones, as we come to the table of the Lord and receive that bread and that wine, oh, I pray that we shall have a fresh view and a new appreciation of that great sacrifice. Well, the hour of death finally came, he bowed his head and died. And as the shadows gathered that Friday evening, the disciples took the body of Jesus down from the cross, and he was placed in Joseph's tomb. The dead Savior, how they mourned over him. How they thought of all his love. And now, oh, isn't it strange, friends? They didn't know that they would see him again, although he told them many times. Human nature seems to remember the thorns and forget the flowers. To remember the clouds and forget the rainbow. And so they thought only of the terrible disappointment and remembered not his oft-repeated promise that he would rise the third day. But the third day, thank God, he did rise again. He appeared first, you remember, to Mary Magdalene and brought her the word of comfort. Later that day, on the road to Emmaus, he traveled with those two disciples and drew their attention to the wonderful fulfillment of prophecy that they had witnessed in just a few days before. And finally, he appeared to them in the upper room along with the other disciples and showed himself to them as the one that had died for them. They saw the wounds in his hands and feet and side and worshipped him as God. Forty days later, he led them out to Bethany, and there from the height of Olivet he ascended, while a cloud of angels received him out of their sight, and two remaining messengers pointed the disciples to the glorious hope of the return of the Lord. And it is that hope which is cherished in our hearts tonight, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, I think you would like to sing with me now one of Sister White's favorite hymns, one of those most famous hymns of the church written by Wesley, Jesus, lover of my soul, let me to thy bosom fly. And as we look at these most beautiful pictures and sing these beautiful words, let all our hearts go out in glad appreciation of what Jesus has done for us. And thus may we be prepared for this holy service which we shall celebrate tomorrow at five and for the year that stretches ahead. Before we have our closing prayer, is there anyone here that perchance has never given the heart to Jesus that would like to tonight, this first Sabbath of the new year? If you would just raise your hand where you are. Yes. Is there somebody here tonight that has given your heart to Jesus in the past? You feel that somehow your hand has slipped out of his hand? Tonight you'd like to put your hand back in his and walk with him? Would you like to raise your hand? Yes, my brother. Yes, sister. Yes, sister. Oh, how happy Jesus is for every one of these. Shall we all rededicate our lives to Jesus? Dear Father, we thank thee so much for the gift of Jesus and a new appreciation in our hearts tonight of that wonderful love which led him from the throne to the manger and from the manger to the cross. And oh, we thank thee, thank thee that he's back on the throne again, but for us, only for us, all for us. 
We thank thee that he's the way shower, the forerunner, and that we're going in the path that he's opened up for us. See these hands. And hear these rededications of lives tonight. May each one be linked with thee in a new fellowship of full communion. And may each of us go from this upper room tonight happy in thee. Not on some strain to keep a certain measure of excitement, but happy in the thought that the shepherd is keeping the sheep. Prepare us to go out in ministry tomorrow morning. Prepare us to return to thy table the vesper hour tomorrow, that we may share in that building up of body and mind and soul which comes from feeding on the bread of life. We thank thee for it in Jesus' precious name. Amen.